March 4th, 2015, uh, the Ever Forward Club was preparing for our screening of The Mask You Live In at the Impact Hub Oakland. We had over 275 people RSVP'd. Some families were making food, we had some wine donated. It was gonna be the biggest event we've ever thrown. Now that year I was a vice principal at a middle school in Oakland, Montero Middle School, and I was taking the day off because I had a lot of things to prepare. But our team was having this big tour going through the school, so I said I would go in to support the team. So after the tour is over, I'm packing up my office and I get a call on the radio that says a young man needed to see me. So I said, go ahead and send him back. And when he came to my office, he said, um, oh, I see you're packing up, so I'll just leave this letter and then I'll go back to class. I said, well, you know, I got a few minutes. I can, I can read it. And so I opened the letter. And this is the letter. Dear mom, Mr. Branch, and family, I'm planning to kill myself today tomorrow or the next day. I've been studying what I'm gonna do to commit suicide. I was gonna hang myself, but instead someone told me there's another way to kill myself without feeling pain. So I'm going to drink a bottle of Benadryl before I go to sleep. The reason why I'm going to do this is because it feels like I don't fit in this world. And I'll stop there. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you find yourself in your, your life, your goals, your aspirations. But this young man at 11 years old was at a place in his life where he said, I had enough. Like, I'm, I don't want no more disappointments. I don't want no more setbacks. I don't want no more problems. I'm just ready to check out. And I don't know if you've ever been at the place where you just had enough. See, the problem that we see in the Ever Forward Club, the problem that we see is that young men find themselves in these mental prisons, which govern how they find themselves in the world and the people around them in, the, in society. And so what we've done with this program, the Ever Forward Club, well, let me tell you about the, the box, right? You probably have seen, heard about the man box. So our young men find themselves locked into this box where they can't get out. This art was done by a young man at the Bay School. It says, let me out this box, man. But all these things that our young men are taught on how they should behave and how they should act and how they should show up tells them what it means to be a man, which often sometimes feel incongruent to what you feel inside. But if you're told that you can't be sad, if you're told that you can't be afraid, if you're told you can't have these human emotions, then you end up bottling it up. And our young men do this on a daily basis. Now, many of them don't commit suicide, although over four young men and boys commit suicide every day. Most of them commit to other behaviors that are a slow death, drugs, alcohol, rampant unprotected sex, joining gangs, violence. There's so many other ways that the death happens, but the death eventually does happen. And so what do we do? In 2004, I was a math teacher. I had left engineering to become a teacher, and I wasn't doing a good job. Like there were so many students in my class who were smart but were failing. And I said, well look, I already accepted that as a teacher I'm gonna be broke. But I'm not gonna be broke and a failure. So, there, so there's a way. So what I did is I brought these students together, for about 15 students, and I said, listen, I'll buy you lunch once a week. In exchange for me buying you lunch once a week, you teach me how to be a better teacher. Like tell me what I'm doing wrong, because I'll fix it. And what I found it from them was that it's not cool to be smart. Like that school, in that community, smart doesn't get you respect. And so they acted in ways that they thought was gonna get them respect. And so what we created with the Ever Forward Club is a safe place for young men to talk about whatever they need to talk about, to deal with some of the emotional baggage that comes up in men, but that we often tell our boys and young men don't feel. We often tell them, stop crying like a little girl. Don't be a sissy. We tell them so many messages and then on the playground you hear them, they're much more vulgar than what I just told you right here. <laughs> Our young men are following in this pattern because they believe that that's what they need to do and how they need to act to be men. So what we created and what you see if you've seen the documentary is we have this workshop called Taking Off the Mask. And Taking Off the Mask is really a space for people to come together and get real. How many of you were in the workshop on Saturday? Awesome. 
Thank you all for being here. So if you weren't there, the, the way the workshop kind of works, and it's hard to tell you about it all, but let me tell you the, the simple version, is that what we do is we let people talk about what's on their mask. Like, what are the things that we show the world about ourselves, right? We can, we've been here for three days. Like, we've seen people walking down the hall. We kind of see the characteristics of people. So we ask them, what do you let people see about you? What are those characteristics that you let the world see about you? And then it gets a little harder, because to talk about what you think you show the world already is probably pretty easy. But the next part is like, what are those things that you don't talk about? What are those things you don't get a chance to express? You don't get it, you either hide or ignore or try and pretend they don't exist, and it's the other stuff. And so no matter where we've done the workshop, whether we're in the Presidio, whether we're in East Oakland, whether we're in Los Angeles, whether we're in San Diego, it's pretty clear that there's a mask we're wearing. That there's a mask that we show the world about ourselves, and then there's the other stuff. And so whether you're a middle school student in East Oakland, who on the outside you're showing the world that you're in control, confident, and fearless. And in Oakland, you better show you're fearless like it's required almost. But deep down inside, you're dealing with some depression, family issues, and fears. Or whether you're a private school student in high school, and on the outside you're saying, I'm relaxed, athletic, I'm all right, I'm happy. But deep down inside, you're dealing with some rage, some tension, and some tears. Or whether you're a parent, who's like, man, I'm, I'm happy, I'm friendly, I'm a mom. But deep down inside, feeling some other things, not feeling like you're good enough, feeling like you're all alone or have to be all alone. Or whether you're a teacher who's like, man, I'm knowledgeable, I'm caring, I'm independent, but deep down feeling some fear, anxiety, and shame. Over 4,000 people have gone through this workshop and the other day, some of our young people were here as a part of getting a chance to experience taking about 200 and something people through the workshop here. And so I thought that I could tell you all day about Ever Forward. I could tell you for the 12 years I've been working on Ever Forward full time, not being paid as a full time job, working Ever Forward after work. I could tell you about all of that. But I think the best thing for you to hear is from a young man who was in our program, who was not only in our program, but then decided to come back and become a mentor for our program. So I want to present to you Lorenzo Cooper. Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> My name is Lorenzo Cooper, I'm born and raised in East Oakland. Um, um, I've been a mentor now for a year, so my experience with the Ever Forward Club has changed now. I've been involved with the Ever Forward Club for 11 years now, and that's, that's amazing because when I first got to the club, I honestly didn't believe that I would make it to be alive past 18. I had lost a few of my friends to like street violence. Both of my parents were like heavily addicted to drugs, so like what I thought was normal was a little bit different from what other people thought was normal. And what I put out into the streets, into like the world, what I let them see about me was not who I really was. And it wasn't until I got into the Ever Forward Club that I saw who I could really be and just actually step out of that box, you know what I'm saying? Because I was definitely enclosed in a box that I couldn't ask questions, I couldn't feel any sadness or feel any anger because of the environment that I was. I was always a punk or, uh, any other type of words, you know? And now that I've been doing this mentor work for a year, it's like 
I see myself in the youth that I mentor. And like to see that resistance of being yourself because you want other people to look at you a certain way, it, it makes you want to work that much more harder, if that makes sense. Because no one ever done it for me besides this man right here. So in order to do what someone's done for me, it gives me a, a really elated feeling. <laughs> To sit on this stage is like a really good feeling for me as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I have a special request for you all. I have a special request for you all. Because my parents didn't ask me these questions. They didn't provide the safe space for me. So I know you guys all know young people, young men, young women, young people who are all going through similar things that they don't share with the world. I ask that you reach out to them. I ask that you give them some type of safe, pla safe place to be vulnerable, to be able to say, hey, look, this is what I'm going through. This is why I can't be focused. This is why I am the way that I am. And it's not because it's who I am. It's because I'm dealing with something. I ask that you all just take that opportunity with the people in your lives. And I ask that you stay in contact with us because I'm very friendly, so. <laughs> Visit us on Facebook, Instagram, you will most definitely see my face again. Thank you. So, um, the end of the school year happened. It was around June, and uh, a, uh, got a call from the office that the student was uh, wanted to see me. So he went away for a couple of weeks, came back to school, and we checked in here and there. So at the end of the school, they said, the student is waiting to see you in the office. I run to the office. He's not there. I go chasing around looking for him. I finally find him. He runs. But he's smiling, so I'm hoping that everything's okay. I said, well, you need to come find me in my office. So later that day, he finds me, and uh, he hands me a piece of paper. And I said, well, let's go to my office, because I'm kind of not sure what's about, what I'm about to read. <laughs> and um, he said, no, it's okay. And so I went to my office anyway right away and read it, and um, here's the letter. Thank you letter to Mr. Branch. Dear Mr. Branch, I want to thank you for being there for me. If it wasn't for you, uh, I wouldn't probably be here right now. I hope to see you next year. Mm. Because I'm going to need somebody to share my feelings with. And you is one of those people I can talk to. And I want to thank that for you. And so I want you to know that if you haven't yet done your own work to get clear on the messages you're giving our young men or your youth, please make sure that you open your heart to let them be everything they are. So that when they are feeling at the end of their rope, that they know they can go to someone. And if it's not you as their parent, find them a mentor. Help them find a community of other young people that they can talk to in a healthy, safe, healthy space. We thank you for being here today, and thank you for your time.